We covenant to be eager for ministry to go in a new direction, to embody God's unconditional love for all people, to grow spiritually through prayer, Bible study, mutual support and caring, and participation in our church's outreach ministries, to worship God in spirit and in truth, to welcome extravagantly, to ask in faith, believing it will happen, to be on the road to tithing our time, talent, and treasures, to build our temples to God in mind, body, and spirit, to be at peace with one another, and speak no ill of anyone, to strive to be in one accord with the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ, to think it in our heads, believe it in our hearts, and definitely do it with our hands, to be at the heart of the community, with the community at its heart. Please join me in the call to worship. The Spirit of God calls us from many places. Some of us come from busy homes with many people. This week has been different for each of us. Some of us have had happy news we want to celebrate. Yet we come to the same place all of us seeking God's presence in our lives, all of us seeking God's touch. We are present with one another, and together we become God's family. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God of infinite love, we are part of your family, and we are gathered together, ready to hear a word from you. Each one of us is the child of a mother, a person who gave us life and made the best decision she could for our well-being. Today we celebrate motherhood in its many forms, and each of us is also a child of God. You made each of us unique and gave each one special gifts, talents, and skills. You are the parent beyond our parents, the one who loved us before the earth was made, and the giver of everlasting life. We thank you, God, that you don't expect us to be perfect. You know each of us, our strengths and weaknesses. You forgive us when we come to you and tell you our mistakes. And once you've forgiven, you no longer hold our sins against us. As we worship here today, search our hearts and know our minds. Hear the notes we forgot to sing and the prayers we cannot put into words. Let us feel your presence today and stay with us through the coming week. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that God, that Jesus taught. Our Father 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from John 19, 25 through 28. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 943. So the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. The son's the reading of our word.
I always think to myself at this point in the service, oh, this is when the sermon is supposed to be. And then I realize, I guess I need to come up with one. Join me in a moment of prayer. Loving God, this is a time that people have gathered to hear from you. They may be a little bit interested in what I have to say, but they're much more interested in your message, in your thoughts, in your wisdom. So come into this place now. Take my words and turn them into what you need them to be, to grace this place. Amen. So I've, I've had an interesting week um, thinking about mothers and Mother's Day. <clears throat> I work in the church office now and I prepare the bulletin and our hot topics and, and it's always interesting to look for things to put out. And the, the thing you always have to keep in mind is that God's at work behind all of this. Now, <clears throat> each week as I prepare the Sunday bulletin, I look for a picture for the cover that's very appropriate to the sermon or to the scripture, and usually that would be both. Um, so this week I found a wonderful, wonderful picture. It was Jesus on the cross, and, and it was kind of a line drawing, a simple line drawing. Jesus on the cross, and in front of Jesus were some mourners watching him be crucified, and I assumed that his mother Mary would be there. Um, so I put that on the cover, and I was just about to print them, when all of a sudden, I got this little word from Jesus, and Jesus said, no one wants to see a dying man on Mother's Day. <laughs> Find a better picture for that cover. So everybody needs to appreciate the cover of their bulletin today and the lovely flowers that are there instead of Christ on the cross. It doesn't mean we forget about Christ. It just means that maybe Mother's Day is not the day. Um, now, I also have the advantage of, of having days and days to think about the scripture and to print it. You'll notice it's, um, it's actually printed in your bulletin today if you missed it. It is um, on, on this page that with, with the sermon notes. Now I will tell you I am not using this outline, but there is space there and you may want to write some things down or not. But it's, it's available if you would like to. So one of the things I came across this week, I had, I had found this lovely little poem to put in our hot topics about mothers, and then somebody sent me something that really kind of shook me up, made me stop and think, made me realize that, that maybe I'm thinking of, of Mother's Day in too simple of a way. And what it was was a blog post, um, an online journal, by a woman who said that she used to just skip church on Mother's Day because it was too painful for her. Too painful because she had been married and for many years she and her husband tried to have children and no matter what they tried, they were not able to conceive a child and so she was childless. And she said that in her church, every Mother's Day, the pastor would say, now all the mothers stand up and they would applaud and she would sit there feeling horrible, feeling humiliated, feeling like there was something wrong with her because she was not able to be a mother and it was something she longed for her whole life. And so it made me stop and think that, that motherhood is more than just a woman who had a baby and raised the kid, right? There's a whole lot more to it than that. And there's a whole spectrum, a whole continuum of types of motherhood. So in our congregation today, there are people who are not yet mothers, but soon to be. Um, somebody wrote to Dear Abby, I don't know if you saw yesterday's paper, <clears throat> somebody wrote to Dear Abby and asked, um, she said her daughter-in-law wants to celebrate Mother's Day, although she has not had the baby yet. And, or maybe it was Miss Manners, it was one of those. Anyway, but the, the issue was, um, first of all, why is this woman announcing what celebration people will have for her? But secondly, Mother's Day started out as a time for children to celebrate their mothers, and so since she this baby, you know, is certainly alive and well, um, it's not really able to throw a party yet. And so, so maybe, maybe it's not time for her first Mother's Day, I don't know. Um, uh, so, so there are people who are about to be mothers, there are people who are trying to be mothers, and there's an issue of infertility. And, and that's not new, that goes back through the whole history of humanity. Um, and, and many of the women in the Bible, that's one of the issues that they deal with. There are women who, who had their child, but they, they lost a child. Um, losing a child at any age can be a very traumatic thing. 
Um, there's actually a special organization called Compassionate Friends, and their, their sole purpose is to support and help parents who have lost a child of any age. It can be a child who's 70 and you're 90. Um, but you can still go to Compassionate Friends. And I know people who have, have used that organization because they've lost a child. There are people who have a rotten kid. <laughs> I know nobody in this church, but there are people who have had a rotten, rotten child. Someone who, who broke all the rules and caused all kinds of mayhem. Maybe they have a child who, who ran away from home and completely left the standards and morals they were given as they were growing up. There are mothers of adult children. Some of those adult children have moved back home. Some of those adult children are doing things that they just really love and appreciate, and some of those children are not. So we have a whole spectrum of motherhood, mothers of teens, mothers of, of children of, who are very young, who are spending their whole day wiping faces and other ends, and, and cleaning up after children, and, and um, <clears throat> scrubbing crayon marks off the wall. <clears throat> so at every stage of motherhood, there are challenges and there are blessings. Now, we know that not every, well, not everyone here is capable of being a mother because a lot of us are men. But for the women here, for the women here, um, not everyone here is a mother, but everyone here, I believe, has a mother, right? I was, it's embarrassing to admit, but as we, as we were singing the anthem, through my mind went the old saying from, from when they first did test tube babies, that a test tube baby has a womb with a view. Um, <laughs> but I suppose they still have a mother, of course. Um, so certainly we have mothers from, from all different stages of life. We have a lot of single mothers, mothers who have had to take on the kind of the role of father and mother to their children. Um, for various reasons. So I, I found that kind of an interesting thing. And, and it really kind of ruined for me the idea of let's all stand up, the mothers stand up, and we'll clap. Because, because we don't want to cause grief to somebody, do we, as a church? We want to celebrate everyone. So then I was thinking about, about the fact that you know we've got all these kinds of mothers, but we also have a Bible going back thousands of years <clears throat> that talks about mothers in a lot of these circumstances. <clears throat> Excuse me, they say that there's nothing new under the sun. Solomon said that, and that was a long time ago, so even that saying is not new. Um, so, so there's nothing new under the sun, and there's nothing new really in motherhood that, that didn't start a long, long time ago. So I thought we'd take a few minutes, and unfortunately for me, when I was putting the bulletin together, I had this very nice list of mothers in the Bible, and it's in your bulletin, so just don't look at it for a minute. <laughs> I don't want to ruin the surprise. So who was the first, we're going to do a quiz too, who was the first mother in the Bible? Eve. Eve. Yeah, she was the first woman, so she was the, the only one around. She's the only one who could be the first mother in the Bible, right? And she had two wonderful sons who got along really well, right? Okay, now, isn't it interesting, in the very first family in our Bible, there was sibling rivalry of such intensity that one brother killed the other. Here's the quiz. How long did Cain hate his brother? as long as he was able. <laughs> and they only get worse from here. So Eve, <clears throat> Eve, um, there was no blueprint. Think about this. I mean, it's hard to imagine today. Think about this. No talk shows to tell her what she's doing wrong. There were no books to tell her how to raise her children. I'm OK. There were no. Um, no guidelines, no other mothers she could ask. <laughs> she was in a very tough spot, Eve was. So she was the first mother. And, and the Bible, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, if you want to write it down, where to find these things. Eve is in the book of Genesis, chapters 2 through 4. Genesis 2 through 4 tells us about Eve. First mother, first one to deal with sibling rivalry, and the first one to deal with, with a capital crime, if you think about it. So there are mothers whose children are in prison or on death row. Eve was the first. And her son was cursed because of it. Now, there's a saying I heard and I, I really like. 
Um, for those of you who were here Wednesday night, this is a repeat. Um, they say Ginger Rogers did all of the dance steps that Fred Astaire did, only she did them backwards and in high heels. <laughs> right? So, so even though it looks like he's working really hard, she's working a lot harder. They say that if men were in charge of babies, we'd only ever have only children. Because <laughs> after once we'd say, ha, huh, <laughs> not happening. Um, Sarah is the next mother I'd like to talk about. Sarah actually had a name change. Sarah was Sarai originally, and then her name was changed to Sarah by God. Now Sarah had an interesting role, kind of like Ginger Rogers. Abraham, or Abram as he started out, got a call from God. And God said, leave everything you know, leave your land, leave your people, take your family, and go to where I tell you to go. Now, how many of you would start a trip without knowing where you're headed? Today, we call AAA and have them plan out the route, and we have our GPS, and we have our navigation system in our car, and we have maps, and we have Google, and um, we can look up how to get from here to there. But God said, take everything you got, pack it up, and go. And I'll tell you where to go as we go. <laughs> now, don't you think that took a lot of faith on his part to follow what God said? But just imagine Sarah, because God didn't say it to Sarah. Abram came in and he says, hey, honey, guess what we're going to do? <laughs> so I think, honestly, that Sarah had more faith than Abraham. Now, is she an important figure in our Bible? I, <coughs> I have to admit that I only found out yesterday morning I was preaching this sermon. And so as I got here today, some questions came up in my mind and I looked a couple things up. I thought, well, now where in the Bible is Sarah? And I was really impressed by the answer. The answer is that Sarah first appears in Genesis 11, verse 30. Genesis 11, 30. And she dies in Genesis 23, 2. So 12, 12 entire chapters of the Bible tell the story of Sarah and Abraham. Think about it. There are not too many people that get 12 whole chapters of the Bible. I mean, Jesus does, right? But, but in, in the book of, of Genesis, there she is. So she is a major, major figure in the Bible. And she was revered. Now, the other thing that happened with her, and I'm not going to ask any personal questions about anybody's age, but Sarah, when she was 90, 90 years old, 90, 9 zero, she got this message. What was the message? Here's our quiz. What was the message? Yeah, you're going to have a baby. I'm 50. I don't want any more babies. <laughs> 90. 90 years old. Where do you find a lot of 90-year-olds? Manor care, <laughs> right? I'm not making fun of 90-year-olds. But, but a lot of 90-year-olds need a lot of help just to get through the day. But at the age of 90, she became a mother. A mother for the first time to Isaac. And what does Isaac mean? Do we know? The name Isaac means laughter. Because what did she do when she heard? <laughs> she laughed. Are you kidding me, she said, and she fell down on the ground laughing. Yeah, so Sarah, Sarah really had an amazing life. She spent all these years traveling with her husband, picked up and went, had all of that faith, and through the whole time, she had this promise that the two of them would be the parents of a mighty nation. And instead of, of having this kid young, it's not until she's 90 and pretty settled that Isaac was born. And then what did her husband do with Isaac? Took him on a little walk to the top of a mountain because God told him to sacrifice his son. Can you imagine what she thought? After all that work to have the kid, and she didn't even lose him. <clears throat> you know, because when you're 90 and you have a kid, it's pretty hard to remember where you put it. Um, <laughs> how would I know? I've heard. I've heard rumors. When you get there, maybe you'll find out too. Um, <laughs> so, so 90 years old, she has a child, finally, after waiting all this time and being so faithful. And then the father takes the kid and holds a knife up to him to, to kill him. Thank goodness God intervened, huh? Then we have an interesting character in the Bible. Her name is Deborah, or some people call her Deborah. 
It can be pronounced either way, even today. You may know some people who pronounce their name Deborah and some who pronounce it Deborah. Now she was um, a lady who really broke the mold. She, she wasn't just your average Jewish housewife. She um, also was a prophetess. And not only a prophetess, but a judge. There was a particular palm tree where Deborah would sit, and people would come to her with problems that they couldn't resolve, and she would tell them what to do. So really a very unusual role for a woman. It, there is in the Bible the book of Judges, which includes her story, Judges chapter 4, but all the other judges are men. So she really transcended the, the limited role of women in her time. This is quite a long time ago. This is before there was even a king in Israel. So Deborah was a judge. And not only a judge, but here's what happened. The general of, of the Israelite army came to her and said, we are about to be attacked and we need to find a way to defend ourselves. And we are horribly outnumbered. He said, in fact, I'm worried we're all going to die. We're all going to die. There's no way we can win this battle. And she said, well, see, we have this thing the other side doesn't have because God wants us to win this battle. So God will take care of it. So Deborah um, told the general, Barak, she said, Barak, you don't have to worry because God's going to take care of it. He says, I'll tell you what, if you're so sure, I'm not going into battle unless you go with me. So she became a, a prophet, a judge, and a warrior. She was like Zena, the princess warrior of Bible times. And so because she went along, they were victorious in the battle. There's a wonderful story. It's, it's one of the, the kind of gross stories. I'm thinking of, of Beth Haynes who struggled through the Old Testament because it's just so gross. Um, what happened is that, that the opposing general got away. On foot, he ran. <laughs> he ran as fast as he could. And he saw a tent. And so exhausted, he goes to the tent and he asked if he could have some food and something to drink. And this wonderful hostess, her name was Yael, Yael invited him in and gave him food to eat and milk to drink, milk and honey. Wasn't that nice? What a wonderful hostess. And then he was so comfortable with his belly full that he decided to lie down for a nap. And Yael took a sharpened tent peg and smacked it through the temple of his head and killed him dead right on the spot. So he didn't do too well either, even though he thought he got away. So Deborah, Deborah rose above the, the roles of women. And, and if you look through life, you'll see that there are certain women who are able to do that. I don't want to get political, but if you look at, in politics, if you look in um, the academic world, there are women who rise above the limits that people try to set on them, and they become more than, than you would think they could be. Um, so we talked a little bit about Sarah, and she struggled with infertility. There was another mother who struggled with infertility. Her name was Hannah, and Hannah had a tough time. Now, back in Hannah's time, men often had more than one wife, and her husband was one of those men. He had multiple wives. Personally, I am baffled by the concept of trying to handle more than one wife, but... <laughs> Wait, I think I'm in trouble. Anyway, um, Hannah's husband had multiple wives, and all these other women were just fertile myrtles. They were popping out babies all the time. And, and every year they would go to Jerusalem for a feast and each woman got a portion of the feast based on who all she had to feed. So every year they're passing out all these plates and Hannah just gets the one because she can't have a baby. And it's just tearing her up. Now, I'm sure all the other, other wives tried to console her, right, and make her feel better. No. No. No, the other wives were kind of bullying her. They were making her feel terrible because infertility was often seen as a curse. So what did she do? She, she left the feast, she went by the temple, and she just started to pray. She was praying silently, and it was so intense. And the priest walked by. And you can tell this priest was a man because he saw that her lips were moving and nothing was coming out. And what was his first conclusion? Ah, she's drunk. She's drunk. So he said, drunk lady, you need to move along. And she said, I'm not drunk, I'm praying. Well, what are you praying for? Well, I'm praying God will let me have a child. So the priest said, oh, okay. And, and what happened was within that year, Hannah had a child. She named him Samuel. 
And the deal she kind of worked out with God was, let me have a child and I'll give him back to you. So now this, in our day and age, is really hard to imagine. She took this baby when he was only two years old and dropped him off at the temple and said, he's here to serve. Two years old, she left her child there and she went back home. She'd come and visit once a year when it was time for this feast. But other than that, she didn't see her child. His name was Samuel. He grew up to be one of the greatest prophets of God and he was the one who anointed King David when he was just a shepherd boy. So Hannah was pretty important. Without, without her, who knows what would have happened. So who do you think is the mother in the Bible that people think of first? Mary. See, you guys are doing so well on the quiz. Mary. I was thinking about Mary. Mary is one of the few people in the Bible where we know her life from very close to the beginning all the way up past when Jesus was crucified. So we followed her through over 30 years. Mary was an unwed teen mother, <laughs> right? When she found out she was pregnant, she wasn't married. She was betrothed, but she wasn't married. And that was a huge, huge scandal, huge. I mean, we can't even imagine now what it would be like. You know, I think we would be as shocked today if somebody gave birth to, I don't know, an elephant. But it was, it was very shocking, very shocking in her day to be an unmarried mother. And what did everybody assume? Well, she's been sleeping around with somebody, right? Because I don't think anybody ever heard of a woman becoming pregnant when there was no man around, when it was only the Spirit of God. So Mary went through that. She went through what we might call an unusual delivery, right? because she had to ride a donkey about 60 miles before she had the baby. She gave birth in a stable. She took her son to the temple when he was only eight days old to be dedicated. Um, even then, people recognized that he was different, that he was the Messiah. And, and we follow her. We don't know much about when she was raising Jesus. We don't know if he was a tough kid or an easy kid. I've always assumed he was just a kid who did the right thing most of the time. Um, and she was with him through his ministry, and she was with him at the time of his crucifixion. Now, Reverend Wallace has done this wonderful series on the seven last words of Jesus, the seven last things that Jesus said from the cross. And one of the last things we talked about this morning in our Bible reading, what happened was, you'll remember that the soldiers cast lots to see who, who would get his clothes. Um, so that's kind of another humiliation. He's not even dead yet, and they're already dividing up the estate. That's not good estate planning now, is it, Dean? <laughs> right. So, so they're dividing up the clothing, and at that point, Jesus is on the cross, and he looks in front of him, and he sees his mother, and he sees John. John, in the book of John, never refers to himself as John. He's always the disciple that Jesus loved. I guess, I guess he was trying to be humble in some way. I've never thought it sounded too humble, though. The disciple who Jesus loved, he and Mary were standing right there. And Jesus, even though he had been horribly tortured, he had been scourged, he had, been, he had had to carry that cross, and he was nailed to it, and he had been there for a couple hours. It's hard for him even to breathe. But in that moment, he realizes that his mother is going to have some big problems because she, we assume, was a widow. We think that Joseph was already gone. And somebody's got to take care of her. So she looks at his mother and says, Behold your son. And to John, he says, Behold your mother. And, and it goes on to say that she went to his home after that, and she lived with him for the rest of her life. So did Jesus care about mothers? Wow. Wow. You've probably heard people use the phrase, I love you to death. He loved his mother all the way to his death and beyond because he made sure she was cared for. So some things to, to, to finish with. Um, the, the poem that I was considering putting in Hot Topics and then it got displaced by the thing about the whole spectrum of motherhood. Um, when I was a kid, I was in a singing group called Etc. And one of the things that we did as a fundraiser was to do singing telegrams for Mother's Day. 
And so we, we got people who bought these singing telegrams and we would go knock on the door and we would sing our little song. I won't tell you what happened when we stopped for ice cream halfway through the day, but it was ugly. Um, <laughs> they say never to eat ice cream right before you sing. Um, so the song that we sang is based on a poem. The poem was by Howard Johnson. He wrote it back in 1915. M is for the million things she gave me. O, I don't know why he put this in, O means only that she's growing old. T is for the tears she shed to save me. H is for her heart of purest gold. E is for her eyes with love light shining. R means right. And right, she'll always be, and don't forget that. Mom's always right. Put them all together, they spell mother, a word that means the world to me. Isn't that sweet? But we gotta keep in mind, there are lots of ways to be a mother. There are lots of ways to be a grandmother. There are lots of ways to be a parent. And finally, I, was, I woke up this morning and I thought, now what is that phrase, what is that phrase, what is it? And I had to look it up, and it's one of my favorites. I saw it on a t-shirt once. It says, well-behaved women seldom make history. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now join me as we sing hymn number 281, The Bond of Love. We need to show some appreciation to Kevin Clem. I say that before the postlude, just in case, you know. I, I'm, you know, having all these thoughts going through my head today, and, and the one I forgot to mention earlier, but this is a good time. Next Sunday is Pentecost, and one of the traditions for Pentecost is to wear red. So next Sunday, wear red in honor of Pentecost. Let's pray. And take one another's hand. Heavenly Father, what a beautiful day you've given us. What a beautiful time of fellowship together. What a, what a way to use a humble servant by putting a person in front of a whole church. We know, God, that you have a sense of humor. Lord, be with us through this coming week. Make amazing things happen. Inspire us to do wonderful things in your name, even if it's just touching someone on the arm and giving them a word of encouragement or giving us, them a smile, something to make someone else's day better. Bless all of us as we go forth from this place. Amen. <laughs>